Aloha and good afternoon, evening, night, or, or morning, wherever you are. So one time the Buddha was talking to a, a young monastic. The name was Sona. And he said, what do you think, Sona, uh, when, when the strings of your lute, before he became a monastic, he was a musician and played the Indian lute. When the strings of your lute uh, were neither too taut nor too loose, but tuned to the right pitch, was your lute in tune and playable? Yes, Lord, Sona answered. In the same way, Sona, the Buddhist giving this advice after he had been away and Sona had been practicing on his own and, and walking with overly exerted energy till his feet were bloody. In the same way, Sona, over aroused persistence leads to restlessness and overly slack persistence leads to laziness. Thus you should determine the right pitch for your, your practice, for your persistence, your energetic output. Attune the pitch of the five faculties and thus pick up your theme just like a mus musician picks up the theme uh, with the other players. What are the five faculties? We already have them in our chitta or heart consciousness. And they begin to play out as faculties and, and even as uh, spiritual powers. Balas, the pancha balas, the five powers. When we start engaging our mindfulness practice, insight practice, and and Brahma Vihara practice, and the five faculties are faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and understanding, wisdom. When I was uh, quite young, uh, I spent a year with my family in Japan. Uh, it was, uh, I went to an international school, first grade there. And I remember a few things. I remember the house we lived in it was very traditional with tatami mats and soji paper doors, rice paper doors, hibachi pots for warmth and futons for um, sleeping. And uh, all. it was a, a total sort of cultural um, immersion. Uh, and a couple of things I remember I remember if we had, we boys had to pee outside the school building. I don't know where the girls had to pee. We all peed in the open, uh, which later I remember as we drove with my family, we drove along the highways. It would be a very natural thing to see people on the side of the road relieving themselves. So I kind of, I remember us like a line of five or six of us boys peeing at the same time. And the, the color of the pee, <laughs> that sticks in my mind. Uh, another vivid memory I've often mentioned uh, in Dhamma talks is uh, of the Kamakura Buddha, a famous 12th century, uh, huge Buddha, so huge. Um, on the side, there are steps you can 
go up the steps and you you enter it about where it's uh, solar plexus is. And, and I remember asking my parents where the heart was and there were further steps up into the head. And I asked them, well, where's the brain? And where's the stomach? You know, where are all these body parts I was learning about at first grade? Uh, so what struck me about this Buddha, one of the things that struck me uh, was it was completely empty. It was a, just a shell, a, a bronze metal shell that looked beautiful from the outside. There was nothing inside. And the other striking thing about this, this vivid experience, uh, the Kamakura Buddha his, historical site was the reverence displayed. I, I, I cert, I, I'm not sure if I understood reverence as a emotion, uh, certainly at that age, not yet faith, which was actually the, the emotion I later learned was being displayed by these people who put flowers and, and candles and folded their hands and, and bowed in reverence. Uh, I had a, a body feeling, understanding of the reverence. It wasn't a mystery to me. It seemed, it seemed natural. Here's this huge mountain-like monument and the respect that people had, uh, even reverence. I think I was associating once I saw the candle lights and flowers and then and then the bowing which i was living in this culture that every day all throughout the day there was continuous bowing and respect somehow i picked that up so the the two things that came away with the memory of this the buddha in addition to the 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 sight itself of the great uh, Kamakura uh, statue was the emptiness and and the reverence, the faith, and it, it followed me along. I, I I certainly learned to take refuge in the ocean growing up. Uh, later in life, if if I didn't like what was happening uh, at home or at school, I. I always found um, stability and solitude and, and refuge in the sea, in the waves, and felt great reverence for the sea, learning how to read the, the surface of the ocean, learning how to read the swells and uh, the weather systems that would come and go, and learning the patience, sometimes sitting there for really a long time uh, until the, the right set of ways would come. And everything within the sea, you know, what, what to do if sharks came by and uh, the loveliness of the humpback whales, the Hawaiian tribe that would come down from Alaska, uh, you, usually by um, late in the year as it got cold in Alaska and they finished eating and breeding and they'd come here and give birth and play. And uh, I remember one time they swam by, a pod swam by close to us and I paddled out. Uh, and, and suddenly where a whale had been, the water became very smooth. You know, it, it, had, it had sort of pumped its fluke with its great strength, and it sent a, 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 a current of wave of water up, of energy up to create that smoothness of the water. Just like if you wave your hand in a bathtub, you, you see the results hitting the surface. And then I, I looked down about 50 meters and, and there it surfaced. It was a relationship. That's how I felt at that time in my young teens, or maybe I was only 12. But here in, in the sea, and then looking at the, the southern 
lick of the Ko'olau mountain range that runs north to south, green, emerald. In that container, I felt safe. And, and I felt a relationship. I felt reverence. And I had, I had that quality, early quality. I learned, later learned as, as the, the, the young sort of spring flowering of faith. That would be so critical, so crucial, so important years later in meditation practice. When I finally arrived at Mahasi's monastery in Rangoon in 1981, early 82, um, and I was, I was ordained by um, the higher ordination by Mahasi. I had taken the lower ordination by Pangpu Sayadaw, Michelle mentioned uh, earlier uh, in reference to having, I think, served him food. Uh, um, he spent 33 years in a cave. He, he was a real yogi, deep yogi. And I'm glad I took the initi initi initiation um, vows with him and was also glad I took the higher vows with Mahasi when I got to Burma. It meant a lot because he, he passed away uh, a year later. And I became Upandita's student. And one of the very first things I remember him saying was, faith is um, all of Vipassana practice, the beginning, the middle, to the very end. In other words, it keeps growing. It keeps deepening in us. Faith, another word for it is um, confidence or in the text it's often the Pali term sadha, which literally means to place one's heart upon is often translated as conviction. To have a conviction in, in something you know, that it's, it's worth waiting for the right waves to come in. It, it's to be confident and have conviction in the relationship with the marine life around us, knowing what to do, literally when sharks came, if there was a, a sense of danger and that we should swim in, or if it was just passing and going its own way and, no need to react that way every time, just because it was a, a human he eating entity. <laughs> just learn to read the signs. And in the same way in our practice, we learn to read the signs with greater and greater conviction and confidence. And ultimately it's an unshakable faith, an unshakable trust where we let the Dhamma do the practice, as I learned from Upandita, um, to do nothing. Practice is learning to do nothing with full commitment, to do nothing and let Dhamma, let the Dhamma current stream through. And we learn everything we need to learn. So right from the beginning, even though I didn't, have a clue what Upandita meant when he, when he said that, I had conviction in him. I had faith in him, his faith, his confidence. And I trusted him more than I had ever trusted any human in my life so far. And, and therefore I just followed the instructions he gave and, and tried, tried my hardest to hear and listen and not to overexert, which I did in my younger years. I was overly persistent and not following the Buddha's advice to uh, Sona. But gradually I learned how to sidestep uh, the trappings like 
blind faith, where we're uncritical and just do something because we hear it or read it, someone tells us to. That's an unhealthy conviction and, uh, and um, a confidence lacking in understanding. For of these five factors, faith is balanced with, with the understanding or wisdom, the fifth faculty or the fifth power as energy is balanced with concentration, the second and the fourth of the five faculties, five powers. And so I, I learned to sidestep and, and because Upandita would ask me if I believed what he said after a Dhamma talk, um, which at first I, I did, you know, kind of word for word, taking scrupulous notes and so forth. But I learned that the correct answer was, no, I don't believe what you said. And I'd be rewarded with, oh, that's good. Even the Buddha would tell his type, his, his top enlightened disciples not to believe what he said, but to, to take what was helpful or inspiring and go off into the forest or, and sit under a tree or sit on a mountaintop or sit in a cave and then see for myself what was true. And that was sidestepping the blind faith or the uncritical faith and taking up the process of what was a true evolution of confidence and and trust in the practice, letting it grow inside and be affirmed by direct experience, which is how faith grows. It grows because we're, we're taught how to be mindful and that mindfulness attunes to this body, uh, this body-mind system with its sensations, its feeling tones, its thoughts and mental states and emotions its volitional actions, and then to see their nature, their behavior, the body-mind streams. And by doing that, and again and again, e even if it was just following the rising falling of, of the breath process, the breath cycle, because what we were tuning to wasn't the breath, that's conceptual, uh, that's like, letting blind faith get in the way, not being critical. It's not the breath we're looking at. What is the actual experience? Well, it's the sensations of tightness and pressure and movement and propelling and tension, peaking, pressure, and then relaxation, softening, collapsing, falling. Those sensations, the myriad, and they're never the same. Each breath is a different configuration of sensations. And learning that the textures are always changing, the temperature from heat to cool always changing, and the, the, the nature of the being firm uh, or vibrating, uh, tight or in movement, always changing always there in some form, but always changing. No two breaths, no two sensations, no two mind moments of observing and feeling the body nature from within the body, knowing the body as the body from within the body are ever the same. And so that teaching of the unique natures, the pressure, the tightness, the tension, uh, the concentration or the restlessness, uh, the depression or the metta mind, as well as the universal nature that is always changing. It's never the same. It's always a flow, a process. So unique and universal. Those realizations were what continued to grow the faith, the conviction, the confidence. 
until there was such a trust in, in the Dhamma current that each time I'd take up the practice in walking or standing or sitting meditation or lying down meditation are just activities of washing the robes and hanging them out. All of those activities, all of those meditative postures were the form, the container within which the faith continued to grow due to direct experience of how the phenomena was manifesting, how it was arising, how it expressed for a, a milli moment, a micro moment, and how it would dissolve, disappear into nothingness like over a waterfall. If we think about the hindrance of doubt, it's overcome by the growth of this genuine, authentic, verified faith. And two other attributes of faith that overcome doubt are, are clarity. The faith brings about um, this mountains, mountain lake like clarity of mind where everything is bright and still and tranquil. And that tranquility is the other quality of faith along with clarity that dispels doubt. So that's why when we're feeling doubt, the clarity that comes from asking questions and understanding the response from the teachers can overcome doubt. And our meditation practice, the samadhi part of it, the fourth of these five powers, brings about the kind of tranquility that also dispels the doubt. The, the second of these five powers is the Pali term virya. Sayadaw Upandita would translate that to us as courageous energy. But it, it's the persistence that the Buddha spoke of when he was advising uh, Sona how, how to find that perfect pitch as he did when he was a musician tuning his loot. And as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, as a young meditator, uh, Vudu Pandita, I, I was quite over exurban, over uh, uh, overflowing with energy. <laughs> where I, I just, I, pla I practiced with such exuberance that I didn't know what perfect pitch even meant, how to attune with the other qualities like faith, like concentration, like understanding. And so I was always exhausting myself. Uh, and only in, when Upandita began to, to realize that I was reporting such long hours of practice and short hours of sleep. And he would he questioned me exactly how long I was sleeping and how much I was eating and how much I was practicing. Did he admonish me to, to turn it down? You know, to, to um, dial it down to a, a reasonable, balanced effort and find its relationship with concentration rather than be exhausted. So the heroic energy that, that virya is known as, the, the energy of a lion or lioness, um, it still applies, but it, it applies best when we balance energy with 
the concentration of mind, stability, and tranquility. And the heroic energy still has great meaning when we apply it to facing whatever we're experiencing, whether it's boredom or terror, whether it's ecstasy or depression, the, the, the whole range of things that we can either be aversive to or attached to or feel neutral, calm about, comes under viewing it through this lens of heroic energy where we're not afraid to feel what's happening. We're not afraid to back away if we're struggling or if we're over exuberant and running ourselves down or if things are going really well, do we have the courageous energy to do nothing? Or is there greed there, attachment, wanting for it to stay or not wanting it to disappear? There's four right efforts under virya. One is in working with unskillful, unskillful qualities that arise, such as attachment or greed or wanting more or aversion, you know, the reactivities of mind that come uh, where we push experience away or we hold on to it and not let it go. Um, so the four, the four right efforts are um, preventing the unarisen, unskillful qualities from arising by being on guard, by understanding, by having known what an unskillful mind state is, what it feels like. Uh, the pain, for example, of holding on, of greed, of attachment, of wanting and wanting more. The pain of aversion, its weightiness in the mind, how it affects other mental states and consciousness itself. So preventing the unarisen, unskillful states from arising and abandoning the unskillful states that have arisen, seeing them, working skillfully with them, not holding on, letting them go. Uh, the internal sense of abandonment. And then the right efforts of, with skillful states, the, arou the arousing of the unarisen skillful states, how to bring them forward, how to understand that a healthy, healthy Dhamma desire is different than attachment or greed for more. There's many healthy desires and wants that are good for the practice. Uh, and metta is one of them. The desire for metta and the increase of metta, balanced metta is, is powerful for our practice and sinks right in, increases our faith and energizes energy uh, and, and um, expands the sense of mindfulness deepens our samadhi and, and um, sort of and blesses our understanding, our wisdom. So the arousing of skillful states that have not yet arisen and the maintaining of skillful states that do arise. Once we know what metta is, we try without attachment to, keep, to sustain it, to continue allowing it to, to fill our body, to fill our emotional mind states and so forth. So those are the four right efforts. Prevent and abandon the unskillful and the arousal and maintaining of the skillful. As I already mentioned with my own over exuberance, it's really important to continually check our energy and its practical 
output in effort as being balanced. Energy is like everything else, just a fleeting moment. And so it, it can change. And if we have a few moments of really good practice, suddenly our energy might become stressed and, and driven. Our attachment may start accompanying the, those energetic moments. And, and we've lost it. And it can just happen in a few moments. So we're always looking to see where the energy quality is. If it is in balance, not stressed and not in the uh, lagging so that we become mentally lazy and that it's balanced with our concentration. The stability part is balanced with the energetic part of our practice. If you're feeling low energy, we often recommend to walk more, maybe walk if we were gonna sit, or just our activities, our daily chores. I, I was feeling tired after noon and after having some soup and crackers. And instead of laying down, I, I went out and watered. And I like watering, especially the time of day that I do, because these tropical birds come and, uh, and I, I spray the, the really high red tea, tea plants I have, not as in the tea that we drink, but these Hawaiian tropical plants are green and red teas. And, and the, the bulbul, the tropical bird, one at a time, they fly into the midst of the tall red um, spray of leaves and they'd let me water them, take a shower. And then it would shake itself off on another branch and fly away and another one, another bird would come and have its shower and go away. It was really delightful. And between the activity, which is relaxing and, and something I like to do working in, in the garden and the extra prize or surprise of being able to bathe the birds, I felt energy return and the, and the fatigue left me, gave me energy. Sati is, is the third pancha, bala, five spiritual powers. Sati is from the word satipatthana, which is our practice. Satipatthana is foundations of mindfulness. And there are four that make up our practice. Mindfulness depends on having something to be mindful of. We have four areas, four domains, four realities to be mindful of. The body, or the body as the body. It is not the body as what we think of it, our conceptual understanding of it, our previous understanding of it, but here and now, right here and now, the immediacy of the felt sense experience of body as body, which are the textures from the range of hard and soft, smooth and rough, so forth. Temperatures from cold, cool, uh, warm, warmth, hot, always changing and different and different parts of the body. Just as textures can be uh, hard and rough, in the shoulder, but if we, if we look on our thigh, it might be soft and smooth, the sensations. And so too with temperature. Hot in one area, we'll look for an area in the body where it's cool, maybe the feet, the extremities, the fingers. So we learn to feel the body as the body, as it truly is the areas that feel uh, firm and tense, which is the element that keeps us sitting up straight or able to stand, able to walk, uh, and the areas that are fluid, in motion, and vibrating. Just two ends of the same spectrum. We investigate the body as the body and the feelings as feelings. 
And here feelings are meant as a feeling tone, not as a um, mental state or emotion feeling, but simply the momentary sense of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling tone regarding this sensation, these sensations, this body, this visual experience, this sight or that sound, this mental state that's difficult and hard and heavy, or that mental state that's light and uplifting and beautiful. And other sensations are emotions or mental states that are neither heavy, weighty, or light and uplifting, but have a neutral tone to them, or even. What about those? We often miss those. Neutral, when we add that on as part of our meditation instructions, we often caution, you know, that, that by nature, we're kind of intent, taught to be intensity junkies. And they say, look for feeling tones. We tend to look more for something clearly pleasant, clearly unpleasant. And something in between uh, is easy to miss. And so we often don't light on that. Sayadaw used to advise me just like in generally doing the walking, sometimes just notice out of the periphery of vision, the rocks on the side of the path or leaves or dust. He said often that visual experience is a neutral feeling tone versus seeing a monastic who's a friend where I might feel delight, happiness arise. Or something like a dog fight in the monastery that's unpleasant to hear and see. And the mental state then being more negative, harsh, uh, aversive. So body as body, feelings as feelings, actually just as they are. And critically, to notice a difference between a pleasant feeling, which is normal and natural and happens all the time, within a few seconds, all of us experience a pleasant feeling, even if it's when unpleasant falls away. Often we'll miss the absence in the wake of that unpleasant feeling fall away, when in truth, it's a pleasant feeling tone or even a joyful one. So we don't want to miss the, the huge difference between pleasant feeling tones regarding all six sense doors, sights, sounds, senses, and mental states, and the reaction to the pleasant feeling tone, which is attachment. Attachment isn't a natural, normal arising like pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. It's a response, it's a learned response to be attached to the pleasant. When we're mindful, the attachment falls away and it's just pleasant and we can abide in that pleasant feeling tone or even in its form of joyousness, uplifting, ecstatic, and there still not be attachment. We learn to do that in our meditation practice. And likewise, to notice the difference between unpleasant experience, sharp pain, persistent or chronic pain, unpleasant, annoying sounds, sights, senses, and so forth. The difference between that, which is normal to all sentient beings, all beings with the six senses experience these unpleasant sensations, just like they have pleasant ones when they're enjoying their food, enjoying their rest, enjoying familiar sounds and sensations. To notice the difference between the unpleasant experience through any of the six senses and the reaction of dislike, aversion, ill will, rejection, anger, suppression, pushing away. There's a huge difference between abiding in knowing unpleasant and the reaction and narrative that accompanies 
the reaction. Oh, I don't like this, which just didn't happen. This wasn't happening a few minutes ago or in the last sitting, or how do I get rid of it? And, and the proliferating Papancha narrative that comes with the aversion or comes with the attachment. The accompanying narrative doesn't come when we're mindfully abiding in pure, pleasant, even ecstatic feeling tone experience or abiding in the awareness of the rough, but simply unpleasant feeling tone regarding sights, sounds, sensations, and mental states that don't feel good, that are unpleasant. And then to, to study the difference between having no reaction and no accompanying mental states that are proliferating around the unpleasant and just, oh, this is the way it is. This is the truth. This is what's happening. The truth liberates. So feeling these pleasant unstation, uh, unpleasant sensations not only increases concentration as Upandita and our teachers used to tell us as a kind of trick to get us to stay with unpleasant. I mean, they loved when we came and reported dukkha sensations. My back is aching, my legs, I can't feel them. They may as well just fall off. Uh, my shoulders are burning. I'm just in complete bundle dukkha. And Sayadaw and the other teachers would, would grin, ear to ear grin. They'd be so happy they were experiencing all this dukkha because we were going straight to it, straight to the truth of existence. Well, it's the Buddha's first noble truth, the truth of dukkha. We're asked to understand the truth of dukkha, that dukkha exists, that dukkha is there with that sensation, with all of the sensations, with that sight, with all of the sights and all of the sounds, all of the sensation, even if just only for the reason that they're all impermanent and they're all falling away and nothing leaves a handle for us to grab onto for security, for sustaining pleasure and for pure, reliable happiness or peace. The literal translation for dukkha in the Pali language means a cartwheel, like from an ox cart that is wobbly. You know, the wheel is somewhat bent, so it's askew. So when you see the wheel, which you see a lot of in Burma, and I used to see when I lived in India, the cart is continually kind of swaying back and forth with the wobbly wheel. Well, that's our life. Our body, our mind is like a wobbly wheel. The people that we know, our friends, our family, all sentient beings, all of life is like a wobbly wheel. None of it's reliable, none of it is sustained as permanently pleasurable, providing peace and happiness. So if we understand this wobbly nature, then whether we're having dukkha sensations as the sayadas like this to have, because it would immediately plunge us into the depths of practice, get us concentrated and get us not being attached to the body, which is a huge thing. Because once we loosen the attachment to the body, feeling pleasure, we actually loosen attachment to anything and everything to a goal-oriented practice, to a bliss-oriented striving, to an idea of success in, in Dhamma meditation. So, so it's so valuable, it's so important. It's just a natural phenomena and mindfulness of feelings teaches us that. And the difference between feelings being the condition for there to be craving as in attachment and aversion and feelings with mindfulness that conditions awareness and wisdom, liberation. 
And the third foundation of mindfulness is the mind itself, which we've been talking a lot about. At first, it's noticing the thoughts, mental states, um, mental formations in general. Ultimately, it's a very refined and intricate awareness of moments of knowing, the stream of knowing itself impermanent, itself a stream like the body stream, like all the other mental states and emotions, consciousness itself, like a river, is made up of the water molecules, each separate and unique, each changing, none lasting, none solidified into a single body of water. So there's no single uh, unified stream of consciousness. It's arising due to conditions, and those conditions are no longer there. That moment of knowing also vanishes. How do we know? A new and wise, that is, a wisdom awareness moment of seeing the previous moment fall away, recognizes that even consciousness itself isn't to be clung to, cannot within it find any sense of I or me or mine. So we don't even hold on to that. I think I'll finish uh, with in the next talk, talking about um, samadhi and, and wisdom, panya, understanding. Um, but just to remind you that, that faith needs to be balanced with understanding or wisdom because if there's too much faith and not enough understanding, uh, it's not a critical faith. It's a blind faith. And we're just doing stuff out of, out of lies. Des Jesse was talking about clinging to rites and rituals because it was said, so we should do. We need to understand. So understanding needs to be there to make the faith valid and real. And likewise, there can't be too much of the understanding because then it becomes more of a stale intellectual, uh, conceptually based knowledge rather than a liberating Vipassana understanding. So faith and understanding must be balanced as well as energy, concentration, too much energy I've spoken about, not so helpful, too much concentration can create idleness. Uh, we, we become sort of stale and focused, attached to the quietude. So we need the energy interjected into that, into the concentration. And the concentration is necessary to stabilize and tranquilize when there's too much restless, too much energy that can become restless you know, or stagnant. Now, regarding mindfulness, there can never be too much. We can't be too mindful. Mindfulness is itself balanced. The purest mindfulness arises out of equanimity. So equanimity is always there. It's always part of mindfulness. So we can trust that mindfulness, if it feels like it's too much, it's usually energy that's too much or concentration that's too much. So let's just be quiet for a moment. See if you can feel these five faculties, these five powers. The conviction the reverence of faith, the quality of balanced energy, like a musical instrument in, in perfect pitch, and mindfulness like a clear mountain stream that naturally fills up the empty ponds, conforms to exactly what's there, 
to the just as it isness of things. Concentration profoundly anchoring, integrating, stabilizing, and wisdom, liberating wisdom. The heart that sees as it is. Thank you for your awareness.